How you guys doing? Good. Good. I thank you so much. I appreciate that. So welcome back. It's uh, week two of our brand new series called Asking for a Friend. If you've been with us over the past several weeks, you guys were submitting questions. Uh, and then not only did you submit the questions, but then you got a chance to sort of go back and vote on them and say, these are the questions that I want to most hear answered. Um, and you obviously picked the hardest questions for me to have to answer. Um, I appreciate that from, from all of you. Um, last week, we tackled a great question, one that you don't really get to preach on very often. But the question was, um, all the different religions that exist in the world, um, aren't they all just basically the same, right? I, I mean, isn't it possible that they're just different names for the very same God? And so we tackled that question last week. If you missed it, go back. It was awesome. Maybe don't listen to the next five seconds as I tell you the answer to that question again. Um, sorry, I know. You're like, wait a second. He can tell us the answer in five seconds? I can. Um, the answer is no. <laughs> They're not all the same. All the, worlds of, uh, all the religions of the world are not basically the same as, as Christianity. And here was the why. Because of Jesus. We, we said, listen, there's a very distinct Jesus problem that all of the other religions in the world run into. And, and specifically, we talked about the things that Jesus said. We didn't even tackle the things that Jesus did. We just tackled some of the things that Jesus said that gave all of the other religions in the world a huge problem. And, and it sort of led to the second question, the question that we're going to answer today. How do I know that Jesus really said that? And wisely, maybe divinely, I don't know, Somebody asked the question. They said, listen, how do I know that the Bible has not been tampered with? How do I know, right, that it hasn't been altered or twisted or corrupted by human hands and by Satan? I was like, man, that is a big question. It's a great question. And so today, we're going to tackle that question. Now, normally... This is the moment where I tell you to open up your Bibles and flip to a text, right? But as we're going to talk about the text in question, that seemed like a little bit off, right? I mean, to, to use the book that we're questioning about whether or not it's true and trustworthy to exonerate itself seems like a, I don't know, maybe like a self-fulfilling prophecy, begging the question a little bit, one of the, a straw man argument, if you will, maybe one of those. So for the purpose of tackling this question today. I'm going to use less scripture than I normally do, all right? There's still some scripture today. We're going to have some at the end of everything, but to be fair in how we come at this, right, we're going to have less scripture. So just give me some leeway today, all right, at least enough to hang myself with. Um, thank you. Some of you have used that as parents, all right? But uh, I've got some good stuff, and I'm going to try my hardest not to geek out today because we've got some great stuff when it comes with regards to history. Some of you just went, I know, I know. Church history, I get excited about it. Some of you not so much. I'm going to do my best today. Um, but I want to help you to understand a little bit about how we got to where we are today. Um, so this question, right? This question shows up in, in, in a bunch of different forms, uh, but it always has the same accusation at its heart right? And here's that. The accusation is this, that you can't or you shouldn't trust the Bible because it's been altered in some fashion and or it is incomplete. It doesn't have everything there. Now, I love um, how Jeff Ashley, he's the pastor of Parkway Church, he, he described the question this way. He said, if that becomes the case, the Bible becomes nothing more than superstitious insights into archaic myths and fables that are historically helpful, perhaps, but hardly are they inspired or inerrant. We're going to come back to that word in just a minute. That is, the story that the world is telling is it's a gripping conspiracy full of intrigue, subterfuge, secret councils, and villains and it's told in official-sounding documentaries by official-sounding professors. Wow. All right. Well, before I give you my answer to this question, right, before I give you my objections to this question, let's just 
tackle some of the motivations of this question for just a second, right? Some of the people who might come at it and say that the Bible has been altered. One of the people that might come at it is a skeptic. And maybe you're sitting out here today and you're like, you know what, that's me. I'm a skeptic. I, I doubt everything first. When I look at a, a, a glass, it's half empty, not half full, right? And maybe it's not even quite half full, right? And I mean, I, that's how much of a skeptic I am on, on something. And so the skeptic says, listen, um, if the Bible can be proved to have errors in it, then it does not and cannot be an authority in my life. In other words, I don't have to do what it says as the word of God. Some skeptics will lean into the idea that the text was altered early on as a form of like control, whether that was political control or even theological, right, control. And that's really interesting because it doesn't really, the person who comes at it that way doesn't really understand how we got the Bible that we have. Some of you sitting there may not understand this either, but I want you to understand that in the very beginning, there wasn't a Bible that existed, right? There wasn't this being passed around from church to church to church. What they had were letters that were written. They had stories that were written and they were passed and shared and they were copied over and over again. In fact, it wasn't until the end of the fourth century, so almost 400 years later, that we get a codex, a collection, a final saying of all of the things, an affirmative, here's what the church believes are scriptures in the New Testament. It's at 397 in a council in Carthage that we get the 27 New Testament books. 397. Jesus died somewhere around 30 AD. 397. So in order for you to, um, to, to do that, to alter it along the way, you would have to know which of these letters 300 years from then would be considered scriptural, would be the ones that the church would take in. That seems a little bit far-fetched to say, hey, I figured out which book it is that the church is going to use, and so I've inserted these things into it in order to I mean, I suppose. But listen, there are books that made it into the final grouping that they were highly contested. The book of Jude, right? I'm not a huge fan of the book of Jude. The book of Jude was contested in 397 when it made it in. It was contested all the way. You guys have probably heard about this guy named Martin Luther, right? Who started the Lutheran church, right? He started them in the 16th century, he was so against Jude, he moved it to the end of his Bible. In the appendix, he was like, I'm just not sure about this book and about everything that's in it. And so as a result, I'm going to move it over here. Hmm. So yes, it is true that the church got a bunch of leaders together. And they got together in multiple synods or councils that met until finally they came to a, con a conclusion and agreement in 397. By the way, the same list of 27 books that shows up in 397 showed up in 393. They were there then. They also showed up back in 380. They also showed up, you can just keep going backwards through some of the councils, but the final time, the last time that the church said, this is it, these are the books that we're gonna canonize Right? We call it a, a, a canon of Scripture. Canon means a measuring rod, a reed. And so these are the ones that are good for the church to use. And they voted them all in. These are the 27. By the way, they're the same 27 books that if you were to open up your Bible today, is the same 27 books that were voted in in 397. And the conversation at that point ended for over 1,200 years. They didn't come back to it. No more councils took up the question of what books of the Bible the church should recognize until 1545. Now it's significant because in 1545, the Catholic Church and the Protestant movement separated from each other. 
And when that happened, the Protestant church said, you know what? There are seven books that exist in the Old Testament that we're not so sure about. And so the Protestant movement said those seven books don't match a Hebrew understanding of what the Old Testament is. And so we think we should match them. And so the Protestants took out seven books that existed in the Catholic Bible, still exist in the Catholic Bible today. And the Catholics say, well, no, wait, we've always accepted these. And in 1545, they reaffirmed that those were their Bible. But the Protestants said, no, what we think is, is that those are um, apocryphal, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they're extra. In fact, when you talk to a, a Catholic, they'll call them deuterocanonical, right? And that means that they were second canon, right? They were the second measuring rod about what was set up. And so you, you have all of this. Now, listen, as we talk about this idea of, of canon and, and, a, and a measuring rod, I think one of the questions that comes to my mind is, is how in the world did they determine a book should be in the Bible? Right? Like that seems like a legitimate question. Did somebody just all of a sudden one day say, here it is, I've got the answers, here's the 27 books that we need to have. And it was one guy crusading on a mission. Well, you know what? I'm glad you asked that. There actually was a criteria of canonicity, right? What it took to make it into the Bible. Now, a guy named Josh McDowell, who's a modern-day scholar, summated the, the questions that they used. He put it into five questions. Um, if you were reading this in Latin or, or Greek, you would see it's <laughs> like this long as all the things that they were going through. But he summated it in five questions, and here's what he said the criteria were. First of all, was this book written by a prophet of God, right? In other words, was it written by somebody who is a spokesman for God? If so, then it is the word of God. If we can trace, if we can figure out that this really was written by who it proclaims to be written by, by the way, you may find out that there's a book that's called the Gospel of Thomas. It was written somewhere around 190 AD. We don't think Thomas the disciple is the guy who wrote that book. That's one of the reasons why it didn't make it into the Bible. We're like, hey, listen, somebody was pretending to be Thomas who wrote this, so we probably should back off of putting this as being Scripture. Second, was the book confirmed by any of the acts of God? Right? Often miracles separated true prophets from false ones. In fact, that's what Moses said that you were supposed to do. He said, here's how you know if somebody's a real prophet. You put them to the test. If the things that they say don't come true, then guess what? They're not a real prophet. They're not from God. And you should take them out and kill them. That's what Moses said to do with them. By the way, two things on that. Number one, I am not a prophet. <laughs> Number two, don't take me out and kill me. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. I appreciate that. <laughs> now, here's some examples of true prophets. Moses was a true prophet. Elijah was a true prophet. Jesus was a true prophet. The things that they wrote when they said God said this was going to happen, right? Moses walked into Pharaoh. He said, Pharaoh, if you don't do this, here's the plague that's going to happen. Guess what happened? He was a spokesman for God in that moment. When Jesus said, here's what's going to happen, guess what happened? It happened. They were true prophets. Miracles, right, by definition, are acts of God that confirm the word of God. And oftentimes they're used um, through a prophet of God to the people of God. They were signs that substantiated God's message. Number three, does the message of the book tell the truth about God? This one's so good. You see, one of the things that we love about the Bible, even though it's written by 40 different authors over 1,500 different years, is it's one consistent message. This is why you can go to one part of Scripture, and whatever it says, you can use another piece of Scripture to help you to understand what it says. Because the Bible is the same all the way through. And so as they were looking at these books, if there was something that was not the same, that was contradictory over here with a book that they already acknowledged was in, right? They knew that it was written by a prophet of God, that it confirmed the acts of God, then this one was out. It didn't make it. If it didn't align with everything. In fact, I love um, their, their policy of if in doubt, throw it out, right? If it didn't line up, and, and that 
just enhanced the validity of their discernment. Here's the next one. Does it come with the power of God? See, the early church leaders believed that the word of God was alive and active. I still believe this today. And thus, it should be transformative in people's lives, and it should cause edification, and it should cause evangelism. Edification means it builds us up, and evangelism means it sends us out to go share the words. Uh, in other words, if the message of the, of the book didn't have the power to change somebody's life, then God was apparently not behind its message. And finally, was the book accepted by the people of God? When a book was received, collected, read, and used by the people of God, then it could be regarded as being canonical. Because you have the same Holy Spirit inside of you that rests inside of me. And if you're reading something and, you reson and it doesn't resonate with you, you're like, you know what, something's just off with this. If the people of God would do that. What would happen is, is that they would begin to move away from using it. They go, this just doesn't, something off with this, and so we just don't use that one. And because they wouldn't use it, then they would say, you know what, we really need to examine whether or not this needs to be something that all churches need to be using. So I think you can see that it wasn't just one man who was given the task of determining or steering the canon of, of the Bible. Instead, it comes to us through a multitude of years, a multitude of conversations, various leaders, various sets of rules that were there about how a book came to be recognized. And by the way, back to the idea of the Catholic Church having those extra seven verses, the Protestants who said, you know what, we, we don't think there was a council in Jamnia in 90 AD when the Hebrews gathered together and they said, here's the canon of Scripture that we recognize uh, as our Holy Bible, the thing that we would call the Old Testament. It's the same 39 books that you and I have inside of our Bibles today. And they said, that's what we should recognize the Catholics make a great argument about their extra seven. They say, listen, some of these things are referenced in some of the other writings that exist. It was the early church fathers used it. They talked about it. They recognized them. And both of those arguments are great arguments. And so I, I'm not going to give you a, 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 any sort of, here's what's better one or the other on those two sides of things, other than to say to you that I don't think either one of those two amount to tampering right, or corrupting God's Word. Now, not all skeptics cling to this argument of it was corrupted or tampered with for political or theological reasons. I think we just saw how difficult that would have been to, to have happen, right? But some of them say, listen, I want to attack the idea of inerrancy or that the Bible is inerrant. And an errant means that it is without error. Now, some skeptics love to talk data. And here's what they um, like to say. They'll say things like, um, we, that's us as Jesus followers, don't have any of the original manuscripts. Um, now, when you're talking to a scholar, they'll use the word autographs. An autograph is an original manuscript of the Bible. In fact, we don't have one of any book of the Bible. No originals. And we don't even have copies of copies or even copies of copies of copies. Something that might be like third generation. Number two, they might say, and not only that, but no two manuscripts that you do have match exactly. And the closest two manuscripts to each other have at least, count this, six differences per chapter. Wow. Number three, they'll say, we as Jesus followers don't have any early copies of entire books since the earliest of manuscripts that we do have are all just fragments. And number four, there are around 400,000 discrepancies or variants inside of the existing copies that you do have meaning there are almost three variants for every word that exists inside of the New Testament. Wow. Wow. 
Those things sound pretty daunting when you look at that list, right? And what makes it even harder is that list is completely true. We don't have any originals of the Bible. No originals of the Old Testament, no originals of the New Testament, right? And the closest thing and date that we do have is fragments, right? Just small pieces. In fact, a few years ago, there was a a big splash that happened in the media. Maybe you have heard some of this about Hobby Lobby was collecting um, all of these um, old fragments for their history of the Bible museum that they wanted to put together. Um, And it came to light that they were looking to gather a a new piece that had just been found. It had been found um, inside of a, I think it was inside of a mummy's casing that they had peeled it back. And there it was. They had found scripture that that was on it. Um, And uh, another one was found inside of a trash heap where they had found some pieces of paper that was there. Um, And they thought that this piece, which was of Mark, was going to date back to the first century somewhere around 80 or 90 A.D. It's about 10 years ago. And they kept saying, the scholars kept saying, hey, we've seen it. It's going to come out. It's going to be verified any day now, uh, any time now. And a couple of years went by, and it, it didn't come out. And it would have been very, very significant because it would have been the only fragment that we had from the first century. And finally, it, it came out, and when it was um, validated, it was from Mark, but it was from about 140 to 150 A.D. It wasn't quite as old as, as what they originally had thought that it was going to be. It was still significant because it was the second oldest fragment that we had. It was the oldest fragment of Mark that we had, which we think is the first gospel that was written. And by the way, if you want to know this, there is an older fragment It's called P52. It's of the book of John, John chapter 18. And P52 um, is dated to somewhere around 125 to 130 AD. So somewhere about 50 to 60 years after we think the book of John was written, we have this fragment from the book of John. And and they were right. Those skeptics are right that the manuscripts that we do have, they don't all match. In fact, none of them match with each other uh, on on what it is that they say. And I'm going to tell you that that's a good thing. Wait, what? Pastor Charles, you're telling me that that's a a, a good thing? Why? That doesn't make any sense. Let me just give you a couple of reasons about why those manuscripts not matching perfect is a good thing. Number one, it reminds us of the painstaking process it took for the Bible to be shared in the ancient world. They didn't have computers. They didn't have copy machines, right? It was memorized. It was verbally spoken, and somebody wrote it down. It was copied from manuscript to manuscript, right? It was word for word that they would sit there and painstakingly write these things out, and then it would be sent out. That is not an easy process. Second... Second, it allows for us to engage in something that's called textual criticism. Having all of the different manuscripts that we have allows us to engage in textual criticism. Some of you may be saying, well, what is textual criticism? Well, textual criticism is this. It's the critical process of comparing the differences that exist between the manuscripts to ensure, right, and to help to make sure that we have the most accurate translation of the Bible possible. Now, most of you know that I teach from um, the ESV, right? The English Standard Version. And a couple of times people have said to me, well, how come you teach from that and not from like the King James? Well, let me give you one of the reasons why I do that. The ESV is a textual critical Bible, right? The The things that are inside of it have gone through that textual critical process where they've compared all of the earliest manuscripts and scholars have said, this is most likely what the original autograph said. Now, the King James does not do that. It is not a textual critical Bible. The King James was formed off of the Latin Vulgate, right? The Latin Vulgate was formed off of the Septuagint. And don't say bless you to me after that. But the Septuagint was the 70 books written in Greek 
There were the Old Testament and the New Testament together, all of those books written in Greek. And from that collection of 70 books, it was translated into Latin. And from that Latin Vulgate that was used, then that was translated into the King James Bible. There was no sort of, hey, what do the other manuscripts say? What does the earliest source of this say? What's the earliest source of that say? Nope, it was just straight. What this says is what this says. What this says is what that says. That's a good system, right? The Greek Septuagint goes back, and we have some, we have some great early copies of that all the way back into the 4th century. Some great codexes of that. So it's got a good history behind it, but it's not the same as a textual critical. Doesn't mean that it's better. Doesn't mean that it's worse. It just means it's different, right? Finally, finally, it's also good because of this. If everything was perfectly uniform between all of the manuscripts, it would bring into question its validity and its authenticity. Now, police officers will tell you that when suspects, right, when they bring suspects in for questioning over something, if their stories match exactly, word for word, detail for detail about what happens, yeah, you got the idea. It means that they've come up with a story together. It means that they've said, here's what we're going to say if we get caught. And so if all of the manuscripts were perfectly aligned it would scream much more that everything's been tampered with, everything's been altered, everything's been moved, so it's all the same story because nobody wants you to hear or see something different. The fact that we have all of the variation through it allows us to know it hasn't been intentionally manipulated for some purpose or for some end or to hide something or to obscure something. Because, listen, Variance happens with experience. We all experience things slightly different. And it doesn't just happen when we witness something. It happens with the ways that we write, right? It happens when I preach. If you bring somebody different up to preach, even if they take my same manuscript that I have typed out, they will emphasize different things that are inside of it. You will hear different nuances in there because we all bring different insights and experiences to what it is that we have. And just as assuredly as it happens in all of our lives, it happened in the lives of the copyists. And so there were places where some errors, right, had the addition of a letter or subtraction of a letter or an insertation of, well, it should say this to make it flow just a little bit better. But I think it's important for us to understand that the things that do exist between all of those variations, right, none of them impact any sort of core teaching. In fact, I think it's important to know that these variants actually make up less than 1% of the New Testament teaching. I, I read a great example of this, and I, I want to share it with you. It was about a farmer that sent a letter out to all of his different tenants. Um, now, if I'd have been really creative and I had told Loray this ahead of time, I should have put a farmer up on the screen so that you could see like a cute little farmer up there. But um, this farmer sent out a letter to all of his tenants that farmed different areas for him. And, and inside of the letter, he said this. He said, make sure the grain is harvested before the end of the week. Now, this particular letter needed to go to 25 different farms. So what happened was, is that that message was copied 25 different times so it could go to all of the different farms. Now, somewhere along the way, the original letter was lost and we get all the way down through some time. Things happen, people throw things away, fires happen, um, whatever, and all we have left from that original 25 copies are four of them. And those four copies read like this, copy A. Make sure the grain is harvested before the end of the week. Now notice the wrong spelling at the end of the word week. Copy B says this, 
Make sure the grain is harvested before end of the week. Notice the copyist forgot to capitalize the M in the word make. Copy C. Make sure the grain is harvested before the end of the week. Now that has no variance from the original, but we don't know that. We only have four here, and so it is different from the previous two that you already have and will be different from the last one. Copy D says, make sure the grain is harvested before end of the week. Now notice the word D is missing before the word end. So from these four, could you decipher what the original letter was that the farmer had sent out? I think you'd have a pretty good idea, right? You have a pretty good idea of the intent and the meaning. You might not know the exact words that he used, but you're pretty close on it. And yes, I, I know that C has exactly what it is, but like we said a moment ago, you've never seen the original to know that that is the original. Now, the same is true when it comes to our, our biblical variants and evidence. These are the types of variants that make up the majority, 99.5% of the variants that we talk about. And while we don't have the original, we have a pretty good idea of what the original says. Now, I said 99.5% because there are a couple of big ones. I'm going to tell you what they are because it wouldn't be very good if we're going to talk about all this and I hide from you what the big variations are. So I'm going to tell you what they are. Here's the first one. The end of Mark chapter 16, right? In most of the early manuscripts, Mark chapter 16 ends at verse 8. At the end of verse 8, Jesus is dead. He hasn't come back to life. It just ends. But in chapter, or excuse me, in verses 9 through the end, we not only have Jesus come back, but we see this interesting, very interesting, and as somebody who comes from Oklahoma, where there are some churches who practice this, some very interesting instructions about handling snakes and being bitten by snakes. If you bring a snake into this church, I will kick you out. <laughs> there are no snakes allowed in here, all right? Just so that we're all clear. Although I will tell you, I took one to my child's preschool the other day, and they all flipped out. It was great. It was dead, but it was still great. <clears throat> Here's another one. John chapter 7, verses 53 through John chapter 8, verse 11. So about 20 verses, give or take. There's a complete story that's there. Um, some of you will know, know what this story is. Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They try to trap him. They bring a woman who's accused of committing adultery, and he draws something down in the sand. It's a fantastic story. It's great. We love to see Jesus' compassionate heart inside of this one, and it doesn't exist in any of the earliest manuscripts. Did it happen? I don't know. Could it have happened? Yeah, it fits the Jesus that I know and the Jesus that I sit everywhere, see everywhere else. Would I not know who Jesus is if that was gone from my Bible, I'm pretty sure I would still know who Jesus is without that story. But these don't lead me to believe that the Bible has been corrupted or that you can't know what the original intent of it was. Actually, with the ever-growing evidence that is found all the time, I feel more confident today about the Bible that you and I have than ever before. Now, there's one other place that challenges come from, and it sort of has a whole different motivation than the skeptic, right? The, the skeptic wants to call it all into question because he doesn't want to have to follow it as the Word of God. Because if it is true, if it really is God's Word, then he needs to either acknowledge it or reject it. But if he can just doubt it, and cast doubt on it, then he can continue on his life however he wants. But the other challenge comes from, um, from followers of other religions, those who have spun off from the Christian tradition, right? Those like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, or maybe even Islam. Because in asserting that the biblical text, the Bible, is corrupted, 
they can then add that their religion's holy writings exist to correct and to fix the problem. Now, I, I think you probably see the problem in that, that if this one was corrupted and they had somebody who came to fix the correction and give the justification as to why this is now right, how somebody else could then come later and say the same thing about, well, this tradition, which has been passed down for a while through human hands, has become corrupted, and so now we must have, and it's this never-ending cycle. But through that, they use their holy writings to provide some sort of new spiritual insights that will support their religious view. Okay. Those are all really good. And hopefully gives you a little bit of an understanding about some of the motivations that come from somebody who tackles this question. But it doesn't answer the question, right? And I suppose in a sort of a traditional style for just a second, right, a rabbinical style or maybe Jesus' style where he would ask a question back, let me just ask you a question back as you're thinking about this idea. Do you believe in the sovereignty and the providence of God? Do you believe in the sovereignty and providence of God? In other words, do you believe that God is the all-powerful God who has the right and the authority to accomplish the things that he wills? Because if God has the right and the authority and the power to accomplish his will, and by the way, the Bible, along with the Holy Spirit, is the way in which he chooses to reveal himself and his will, then how could he possibly allow for it to become corrupted? Now, let let me just make sure we don't have an understanding when it comes to the idea of sovereignty for just a second. A little bit of a, a, an aside, if you will. Because God has all and is all, right? That's what sovereignty means. But sometimes we get confused on this idea of sovereignty because we struggle with the fact that there's a reality of evil in our world. And we go, well, no, wait, if God is all powerful and all this and his will can never be thwarted, then how can we have bad things that happen in the world? Hang on. Because I want you to think back with me to the moment when God created everything. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. And when God created everything, God, who had all power and all authority and everything, chose to give free will to humanity. And in giving free will to humanity, he chose to give them some authority. He gave them authority over all of creation. So you and I have authority over all the things that exist in the world. We see that play out daily, right? We have, thing, we have abilities as humanity, and we have the ability to impact and affect the world that we live in. But then in chapter 3, we see something else happen. That as humans, humanity, Adam and Eve, they ceded that authority that God had given them to Satan. They chose to acknowledge him as the authority of this world. And so those things that happened, God intentionally chose to limit himself to allow you and I to have authority that we then gave away. Now, this doesn't equate Satan with God. Satan doesn't have the same authority that God has. In fact, I want you to think about it this way for just a second. If the president gives authority to somebody to go do something, right? He says, I want you to go do this task. You have all the authority in order to accomplish that. And that person who has the authority then hires somebody else and says, I want you to do this piece of it. And they give the authority of all of that to that person to accomplish this task that it is. The person that they gave the authority to accomplish the task to does not equate with the president. Because at the end, 
the president always has the right to take away the authorities that have been given. Not only that, but I want you to understand that while God did limit his authority when it comes to you and I, and when it comes to the interactions inside of the world, the way that it exists, because he gave us authority, and that authority then was ceded over to Satan, he gave us all of that. He did not, he never, ever ceded away the power and authority of his word to anybody. It is, and it always has been, his. I should have had some amens, right? All right, 2 Timothy 3.16, all right? It tells us this. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. Then Jesus, when he was praying just before his death on the cross in John chapter 17, he said this. He said, sanctify them. In other words, set them apart. Set all my followers apart in the truth. Because your word is the truth. In Mark chapter 13, 31, Jesus said this. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but I want you to understand something, that my words will last forever. You see, unlike our ability to choose whether or not we will love and obey God, his word that he chose to use to reveal himself and his, purpose, his purposes, which, by the way, his purpose is first and foremost salvation for us and a way to have relationship with him. None of that is tainted. And it's not tainted because of his sovereignty and his providence. He has the ability to, he has the authority and he has the power to protect his word. And not only that, but God's sovereignty leads us into this idea of God's sustenance. Right? God's sustenance. In other words, Jesus, when, listen to this, Jesus, when he was faced with an adversary that attempted to twist and misuse the word of God. Right? He tried to do it for his own purposes and his own gains. Jesus said back to him, Matthew chapter 4, 4, he said, listen, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus justified two different things right there. First, he says that God's word cannot be twisted by man or Satan for their own purposes. Secondly, he says that God's word is where we find life. It is our sustenance, right? It is the thing that keeps us alive. Words that come from the mouth of God, that is what God breathed means. That's what scripture is. Jesus is saying that God's words are good for us to consume. Now don't mistake me again here either because there are certainly false teachers who use their free will in order to distort the words of God. And we, as Jesus followers, have a responsibility to suss that out. And it isn't hard because as we talked about already, God's word is consistent all the way through. And when you see something, when you read something, when you hear something that doesn't line up with other things that you know from the Bible, alarm bells should be going off inside of your head and your heart. I love the heart of John, by the way. He's the, the disciple that Jesus loved. And he wrote five different books that we have in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John. And at the end of his Gospel of, of John, he says this, and it's sort of like, um, here's why I wrote what I wrote, John 20, verses 30 and 31. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written about in this book. So John says, listen, you're going to hear other stories about Jesus. And they might be true, they might not be true. I didn't have time to be able to write all of these things down that I saw Jesus do. I couldn't include everything that was there. But it's not because I'm hiding something from you, right? I didn't not tell you about that story because I wanted to keep it from you. There's not some big secret here that I'm trying to do. Uh, in fact, he says this. He says, even though they're not written in the book, 
what is written here, these things are written so that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In other words, John's saying, I've given you all of the evidence that I could possibly think of to make sure that you know who Jesus is. I've given you everything to understand his character, his heart, his mission, all of it as best as I possibly could so that you would understand who Jesus is. Because I only have one hope, John says. I have one reason for why it is that I've written all of this. And this is this, that by believing, by believing the things that I've written about, by believing all of this about Jesus, you could have life. And he means eternal life in his name, in the name of Jesus. And I love this because it points to exactly this, that God has given us and has protected for us and has provided for us exactly what we need in order to be able to decide and to follow and have a relationship with him or not. That is his sovereignty and his sustenance. Thank you. In other words, if you don't hear anything else today, if you don't walk away with anything else, I want you to take this home. In fact, just write it down. I gave you a pen and a paper to be able to write this down. God's sovereignty plus God's sustenance, I can say that word, Time out, cut. We're going to come back to that one again. That's what we would do whenever we had video in earlier. But here it is. I'm going to say it again. God's sovereignty plus God's sustenance equals security of his scriptures. But Pastor Charles, well, let me just leave you with one last thought on this idea. Right? Because... We see Satan had some times when he could have totally rewritten God's word, right? In the garden in chapter 1, when he and Eve are having a conversation, he can only question what it was. He only caused some doubt on what it was. He said, did God really say? He couldn't come at them and say, God said something that wasn't there. In fact, when he, when Satan has his encounter with Jesus and he's trying to twist things he just decides to omit some pieces in between a chunk out to try to build a different case of which then jesus says no listen i'm going to tell you that it's written and it's all of this and saying you missed a piece of this can't do that it's all of this and it's all good for us and listen even jesus right who was god in his flesh could not change the very words of God. As he was up on the cross, the words that he used were the words that were written by the psalmist thousands, uh, almost a thousand years prior to this. He repeated the words that God had already given so that everything could be fulfilled because God's word cannot be fulfilled changed so do i think that god's word can be corrupted no i don't i don't do i think that additional books of the bible exist yes wait what wait what pastor Charles? that doesn't i i know i know that hang on i believe right that Matthew and Mark, excuse me, Matthew and Luke used another source to write their books. They used the book of Mark as a template, but then because of all the comparisons between them, the similarities, I believe that there was another source that they used. Scholars have called it Q, right? Not only do I believe that Q exists, I believe that Paul wrote some other letters to churches. I believe that they exist out there. Well, I don't know if they exist or not. I believe that they existed at one point in time. I know that the early church had some other teachings that I would love to read. Shepherd of Hermas is one of them. 
The Didacte is another one. Shepherds of Hermas is great because it was all about how to do church. You're a church plant? Here's how to do it. <laughs> I'd like to know that book. <laughs> We're still figuring this thing out. The Didacte is teachings of Jesus, right? They were using those things inside of the, the earliest of church, but we don't have them. So what if we found them today? What if? Well, I think that would be really neat. And I would read them. But listen, I don't need them. Right? I don't need them to know the character of God. I don't need them to know who Jesus is. I don't need them in order to be able to make a decision about following Jesus as my Lord and Savior and to understand that he lived a perfect life. He died as a sacrifice on the cross, was buried, and three days later came back to life so that I could have a relationship with God and one day eternal life through him, because of him, with him forevermore. I don't need it. I don't need it because I already see I have his sovereignty and his sustenance of what it is that I need that's there. They might be interesting, right? But I believe that God has divinely protected what I have so that I could come to those conclusions. By the way, I don't think it's by accident that John, same guy, who wrote the Gospel of John, wrote the Revelation. Right? This book that talks all about the end times, what happens at the very end. And by the way, I know some of you are extremely interested about what happens at the end and about what we as Jesus followers need to know, so come back next week. Because <laughs> next week I'm going to talk about some of the things that we need to know. Yeah, thank you. It's going to be good, so come back for that. But at the very end of the book of Revelation, he says this. He says, I warn everyone who hears the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are described in this book. And if anybody takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. Now, without a doubt, John is speaking about the book of Revelation right there. But I also think, and this is a principle that is found throughout the entirety of the Bible, right? Moses says it in Deuteronomy. David writes about it in Psalms. Solomon writes about it in Proverbs. And even Paul writes about it to the Galatians. We are not to add or take away from God's word. Why? Because it's designed to reveal God and to reveal his purposes to us. Not that I think that we could anyways. But man, I sure don't want to try. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about your word today. And God, I'm so glad that you are so big. And I have so much confidence in the fact that you care about what I know and my ability to know you. Now, you didn't promise that I'd know everything. You didn't even promise that I'd get to know everything when I get to heaven. But you've promised me that I can know enough and that you've given me everything that I need in order to be able to make a decision. Now, friend, maybe you're sitting there and it's the first time anybody's ever laid it all out. Maybe you've been a skeptic for a long time and you knew these questions that existed. I don't know what your story is. I'd love to know your story. Maybe you're sitting here, though, today and you're like, you know what? I'm ready to step across that line. I'm ready to say that Jesus, I have everything that I need for Jesus to become my Lord, the one who's in charge of my life and my Savior, the one who takes away the problem of my sins. The things that keep me from being able to be in relationship with God and will eventually keep me out of eternity with Him. If that's you, I'd like to invite you to make a decision today. 
to say, Jesus, yes. Yes. And if that's you in your heart, you're screaming out, yes, I'd love for you at the end to just come back. I'll be at the back of the, uh, back there with all of the things that are going on with group life stuff. Just come and stop me and say, that's what I want. Maybe you're watching online. We had somebody this last week who texted in online. You can text Jesus follower to 97,000. And somebody from our team will call you and talk with you about what it means to become a Jesus follower. And listen, there's no better choice than that. Jesus, just be glorified in this place. Just give you the glory and the honor. It's in your name we pray. Amen.